Wonderful. Good morning, good afternoon, and a good evening, everyone, distinguished panelists and uh, participants. A warm welcome. We'd like to extend to you uh, to this interactive panel conversation on the topic of what leadership is required to turn uh, war grief into positive leadership for peace. My name is Annika Hilling Norberg. I'm head of peace operations, peace building at the Geneva Center for Security Policy, uh, which is a Swiss foundation. Um, with, we have some 52 countries on our foundation council, and we are here to strengthen peace and security. Uh, the GCSP is absolutely uh, delighted to be co-organizing uh, this uh, meeting, this uh, conversation with the International Leadership Association and the TAPS International. Uh, we have an outstanding panel uh, that I will introduce shortly, but let me start by just saying this. There are many issues and themes that are both interesting and important. But from my perspective, I believe that the focus of our conversation uh, here and now is absolutely one, if not the one most important uh, to address and to engage on what leadership is required to turn horrible war grief into positive and proactive leadership for peace. This uh, session will explore what principles and characteristics that can um, inform or rather transform deep war grief experiences at the personal level into proactive positive leadership uh, for peace. And thanks to our panelists, we will draw in particular on experiences from Iraq, from Nepal and from Syria. And we will discuss what leadership principles and characteristics are required to be able to move from what uh, in most circumstances traps individuals in uh, a victim situation uh, to move forward into a position of strength a position where the individual can develop abilities and capabilities to exercise empowering leadership for peace and for the greater public good. This session is part of a larger project which is exploring adaptive leadership and its suitability and relevance for leading peace building and peace operations and actually more fundamentally uh, building peace. Um, a project that is uh, we are doing with several partner organizations and effort also involving uh, my esteemed colleagues, uh, Pete Cunningham and Patrick Sweet at the GCSP and the Geneva Leadership Alliance. Uh, we are framing the conversation around the original uh, principles or dimensions of adaptive leadership uh, as developed by Ron Heifetz uh, of the Harvard Kennedy School, whom you of course all uh, know uh, and uh, uh, who you will all be uh, well acquainted with. Uh, so we're looking at these dimensions and to what extent they can support and might need adjustment or can be further developed to support leadership for peace and security in the current very conflict prone world. So to recap the uh, dimensions, uh, first leadership today requires to embrace uncertainty while navigating complex environments. And second, we need to encourage innovation and experimentation. And third, leading today require an empathy and uh, priority of inclusion or prioritizing inclusion. And fourth, we need to learn through self-correction and reflection. And finally, leadership uh, today requires the ability to inspire and to create win-win solutions. But colleagues, it is, um, it's all about uh, humans and human stories and human experiences. And today, this is at the heart of our conversation. We have an exceptional panel with extraordinary human stories to share. I will introduce them one by one uh, as they uh, are giving uh, their introductory remarks. And I would therefore also like to do so as I'm before handing over to Bonnie Carroll, our first speaker. Uh, I would kindly ask you to post any questions or remarks in the chat and I will seek to pick them up and then following the uh, contributions by our panelists, we will open up for a conversation and a discussion on, on these. Any questions? 
no questions. All right. Well, uh, in that case, I am uh, really delighted and it's a great honor uh, to introduce the first speaker, which is Bonnie Carroll, who is the legendary founder and director of uh, TAPS International. Uh, she's a widow of an army general and she really um, turned that situation, a terrible um, um, uh, accident, uh, into founding the Tragedy Assistance Program for Survivors, which is today the one recognized American program for supporting uh, 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 spouses that have lost uh, uh, relatives uh, deceased in conflict. And she is also a major in the Air Force, Reso <laughs> Air Force Reserves and has worked for uh, three presidents. And we realized uh, this morning that actually now is the fourth one, because of course you also work with Biden closely. So we are absolutely delighted that uh, this uh, will enable uh, you to work, uh, continue the work uh, also with the new incoming administration. She has uh, experience from Iraq, operating in Iraq 2003 and 2004. And she has uh, a whole uh, tremendous uh, background and CV including uh, executive leadership courses at the Harvard University. And uh, she was also given the Presidential Medal of Freedom from uh, the Obama-Biden uh, administration for her work to support people who uh, have had fa family relatives die in conflict. So Bonnie, over to you. Thank you so much, Annika, for that very kind introduction. I'd like to start by sharing the research that we have done on excuse me, turning war grief into positive peace. This was our presentation last year at Geneva Peace Week, and it's an honor to share that today as the foundation for some of the stories that I'd like to share with you about our work. Death and loss are inescapable repercussions of violence and war. People living in who, or who have lived through conflict, trauma, and war teach us how to turn the devastations of war into a path toward global peace. It is the bereaved, the widows, the orphans, the veterans, and the refugees who have witnessed the very best and the very worst of humanity and have been forced to rebuild not only their countries but their very identities. Grief transcends political boundaries and military objectives. Those killed in conflict zones, whether national servicemen, UN peacekeepers, or rebels leave behind families and friends whose lives must be rebuilt around an unexpected and unwanted void. By bringing women from all sides of a conflict together to share their loss and build bridges of compassion and understanding, both themselves and their countries can be supported and enabled to move forward toward healing and reconciliation. Understanding a shared loss and the origins of a conflict allows survivors to meaningfully, re meaningfully reconnect with the outside world and build more stable communities in the process. The Greek myth of creation tells us that love, eros, and death, thanatos, are born from chaos and darkness. The balance of these forces, love and creation, and death and destruction are common themes throughout the world. They penetrate religion, philosophy, and science. It was a Chinese cosmologist, Zhu Yan, who used the concept of life and death to establish the yin yang school of thought, which is present throughout early Chinese medicine, divination, and government. Much later, it would be Sigmund Freud who used Eros and Thanatos to explain the two forces of life which drive human interaction and behavior. And it would be Freud's insistence that we all succumb to love and death, which would come to be a philosophical underpinning of the renowned Frankfurt School. So it is life and death, Eros and Thanatos, which not only explain the push and pull of human interaction in the universe, it is Eros and Thanatos which best explain grief. Research has shown, although we don't need research to tell us, we only grieve because we love. Grief is a social emotional experience. It is the price we pay for love, 
and the cost of commitment. And it is perhaps the only thing which allows us to feel and in some ways forces us to feel the power of love and death simultaneously. As the powers of love and death are universal, so is the experience of grief. Though the way we mourn is culturally specific, anyone who has experienced love and loss can find commonality in grief. Indeed, even when there are no words, no rituals, and no ceremonies, grief exists. Perhaps no one knows grief better than those living in war and conflict. Death and loss are those iris, ir, inescapable repercussions of violence and war. Research and literature on how people recover from trauma and conflict has shown that people who are living in truly in conflict truly do understand the best pathway forward. While war is waged by nation, it is fought by individuals. It pulls apart families and it takes place within communities. While, it, while the politics of war have convinced us that war is inherently political, the loss of war teaches us that war is, in fact, about people. The death that comes with war may be inevitable, but it is not natural. It is the result of violence and trauma and it is often the young with bright futures ahead who are caught in the crosshairs. As a global community, we have recognized this. It is clear in the monuments we build and the rituals and ceremonies we create. Every nation has attempted to assign meaning to the deaths of its warriors, but what we have forgotten to do, what our monuments and our rituals and our ceremonies do not teach us is how the grief of those left behind has the power to give meaning to the inevitable consequences of war. It is the voices of those who have loved and lost who can tell us the meaning of that the meaning of war comes not comes not only from the fight, but comes when the fight is over. That the lessons of war are not in what our warriors died for, but what and for whom they lived for. Because grief is born out of the forces of love and death, there comes a time in every grief journey when one must pick a side. In our despair, we have to decide if we are going to choose anger, bitterness, hatred and revenge, or forgiveness, joy, hope and peace. You must decide if you will choose more death and loss or more life and love. Today, in the midst of the ongoing trials and tribulations of our global community, I want to remind you that the consequences of war are more than death. I'd like to share a few stories that I witnessed over my time, as Annika mentioned, in, in Iraq, first and foremost. The country that I came into in 2003, a country that had not been allowed to grieve for 25 years, Publicly, Saddam did not allow funeral rituals to take place for fear that the death toll would become known to his combatants, to his enemies. So people there were hungry for an opportunity to remember their loved ones, to grieve their losses. And the humanity I witnessed was breathtaking and beautiful. My translator was an extraordinary woman who had lost so many of her family members over the course of the wars. And she came with such an open heart, giving freely and loving genuinely and authentically. She worked, we all worked seven days a week. We worked Monday through Friday to support uh, our US counterparts. And uh, then we worked Saturday, also Saturday through Thursday su to support our Iraqi counterparts. So Friday, Saturday, and Sunday were sort of split times. So there came a particular Sunday when we didn't have much work for who to do, and we gave her the day to be with family and have rest and take time for herself. And she was very grateful about that. 
it was that morning that there was a, a terrible car bombing at the gate where many of the translators who were working with the Americans were standing and waiting to come through security. 23 were killed in that bombing and she would have been standing there with them. We were just so shocked and so sad by this and never thought we'd see her again, thinking how angry she must be at the Americans for putting them in this dangerous situation. But yet she came back the next day with a beautiful gift, a carved inlaid wooden box and presented it to us. And she said, it was your kindness in giving me that day that saved my life. And it just changed this paradigm of how we witness life and death, how we do have the choice to turn devastation and grief into hope and love and remembrance and honor. I had the opportunity then to create a program connecting these wonderful Iraqi women with American military survivors, confused about what was happening in Iraq, what their loved ones serving overseas were doing. And we created a program with bracelets, simple bracelets made by the Iraqi women, but then presented to the American women we did surveys about grief, asking you know, who they had lost and how that had impacted their lives. And we translated them for each other, the very same questions given to widows and mothers in Iraq and in America. And when we exchanged them, we found their words were the same, that they were grieving the same losses and having the same struggles it brought these two cultures, these two communities, these groups of women together in such a beautiful way and gave them understanding. Many, many years later, we took a group of American surviving family members to, uh, to Iraq and on the way came through Istanbul as a, as a gateway city into, uh, into Erbil and Baghdad. And we had one of the moms who actually was harboring quite a bit of anger because she really didn't understand what her son's death had, had meant to this country, what his service had meant, what his life had contributed to stability and peace. So we went to their military cemetery, their veteran cemetery, a beautiful, beautiful place. And on the headstones there in Turkey, they had enameled color photographs of the deceased, young, beautiful faces in uniform. And when we went there, she saw that there were three Muslim women at one of the headstones, obviously three moms who had come there and were enjoying their lunch with, with their sons and remembering their lives and grieving their losses. And she just saw the grief on their faces and recognized exactly what they were doing because she had done that and she took off running towards them. She had a picture of her son, she showed it to them, she pointed the picture on their headstones and just through, through communication without language, they understood that she was also grieving her son in the military. And just before any of us could get, and get there and translate for her, they were hugging and crying together. And that's what we can do. We can educate, we can inform, we can break down barriers. We can transcend grief and loss. We can choose life and honor and remembrance and peace and healing and reconciliation. The takeaway I'd like to leave you with is that of course we must ensure stability and security first and foremost. When we went into Afghanistan, it was clear that the widows had no support. There was no government benefit. They were out on the street begging. So we had to immediately create economic opportunity coupled with the chance for the women to come together and find that community of mutual support. We created a project with the help of Fauzia Kufi, member of parliament, and just recently a nominee for the Nobel Peace Prize. Extraordinary woman who has become a dear friend. She was a member of parliament from Barakshan, where the finest lapis in the world is mined. So through a woman-owned mining company to the widows of the Afghan National Security and Defense Forces, they created this, these lapis bracelets. 
And now again, in a partnership with military survivors and women around the world, we're giving job opportunities to those widows in Afghanistan. It's a small program, but it's a start. And if we all did something just to make a difference, we can change lives. So Annika, thank you so much for allowing me to share a few stories and, and our research with everyone. I look forward to the conversation that is to follow and I'm so honored to be with dear friends. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very uh, much, uh, Bonne, for this very uh, powerful um, uh, intervention. And I really appreciate the way in which you were reflecting on the nature of grief, which of course is at the center of this whole uh, question. And I also think, thought it was um, uh, very wonderfully um, looking at the power of empathy, uh, leading with empathy on, and the prioritizing inclusivity, including looking to the other, bringing in the other. It, we're in the same boat. It's not about uh, winning or losing. It is about reaching out and and uh, having an inclusive uh, approach to leadership. And also, of course, then by, by doing so and the work that you have used uh, uh, just by the very force of your nature, of your team and, and, and everyone to lead with inspiration, uh, inspiring others to accept cooperation, accept uh, uh, finding win-win uh, solutions. I think it's just really wonderful. And of course, for all those that are caught up in the situation with, uh, with uh, relatives uh, uh, dying in conflict. For them, of course, they have to start off by embracing uncertainty and then still abling to move forward also through cooperation with you and, and your colleagues and everything. So it's just really wonderful the work that you've been doing. And of course, we, we, don't, have, uh, we don't have the time right now to talk about all the, the programs and, and statistics and figures, but it's absolutely just mind blowing. So for those of you who are listening, I would really warmly welcome you to, to, to go to, uh, uh, TAP's uh, website and, and inform yourself better and how you can contribute because this is really leadership in, in action, I would say. So thank you very much, Bonnie, for this. Uh, now I have the um, a very great pleasure and honor to introduce our now, next speaker, which is Hani al Sayed, who is the founder of something called Hani and Coaching, Consulting and Learning Facilitation Business. She is really also, the way how we know her, of course, is she's an associate, um, uh, fellow with the Geneva Center for Security Policy, and she has founded MAP Media and Arts for Peace, which is a global education and talent initiative. Uh, Hani is an award-winning um, uh, media expert, creative social entrepreneur, and certified executive coach. And she has 20 years of experience in this working uh, in Middle East, United States, and uh, Europe. And of course, she brings a wealth of experience uh, to the conversation. Uh, uh, both uh, from uh, her own being have, being a refugee twice in her lifetime uh, and having worked her way through uh, those difficult situations to be a real powerhouse in many ways. For instance, she's also known um, as the uh, Oprah Winfrey of Syria, having been uh, the uh, uh, great, breaking the ground in Syria with uh, the number one rated morning show. Uh, Good Morning Syria, which for six years had seven million listeners. It's almost as many as there are people in my country, Sweden. So really fantastic. But she's really bringing challenges and making things happening. So, Honey, over to you. Wow, thank you so much. That's such a lovely introduction. I appreciate it. And I appreciate everybody here today. And I, I can so relate with what you were saying, Abani, uh, grief is transcendent. So I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and lead with uh, my story. As you heard Annika say, I, I have been displaced twice. Um, and, and that was quite an experience uh, for me in my lifetime. Uh, I've also been in a variety of conflict phases, which means I had to adapt to new environments and uh, challenges. It, but it's that very journey that it taught me tolerance, uh, it taught me patience, and it taught me perseverance. It also nurtured my creativity, my agility, and my resilience in adapting to change. At the same time, it has enhanced my ability to see the world through others' eyes. And that's with a very essential component of leadership, empathy. 
So by uh, sharing my story, I thought maybe I, I can show you rather than tell you uh, about adaptive leadership uh, from my own perspective and from my own experience. I, um, I was born and raised in Kuwait. Uh, my parents are Syrian. Uh, my first exposure to a creative and entrepreneurial world has been through their lens, my family's lens. It was a world that consisted of uh, and still does uh, business and fashion, art curation, advertising, and, and so on. In 1990, uh, following the Iraq invasion of Kuwait, uh, this was the first time I was displaced. At the time, I, I was only 17. Um, I was separated from my family to finish my high school in Egypt, uh, where an incredibly generous Egyptian family sponsored me. Uh, and uh, we're still in touch to this day, of course. Uh, never forget the people that give. Um, also, uh, that school, uh, which was the Cairo American College at the time, that was one of the few schools to find a creative solution to reconcile refugee school records. You lose almost everything, as you heard Bonnie saying, because of war, as probably a lot of people have experienced as well, have worked or worked with people uh, who have grieved due to war. But the agile and courageous leadership of that school and that family's humanity, that gave me a future. Uh, I experienced directly the impact of agile leadership and generosity, and it has stayed with me since. I uh, later moved to post-Civil War Lebanon. This was in 91, 92, as you may all know. Uh, at the time, I discovered that the world is not black and white. Uh, I discovered my own biases uh, when I was exposed to positive exemplars that contradicted negative stereotypes that all peoples of a nation are all the same. That needed an empathetic ear and mind. Uh, when I arrived to Lebanon, Beirut, um, it, was, it was just a ruined landscape, uh, mountains of rubble, uh, debris everywhere, scarcity of electricity, uh, thousands of Syrian soldiers and other militiamen, and you kind of catch the drift. I did my undergrad at the Lebanese American University. I majored in communication arts, uh, radio, TV, film, and theater, and have worked in all of them. What's most important is at the time, I was 18 years old, and it was very mind boggling for, for me, uh, coming from an A political upbringing, to be on lockdown in the dormitory because there was actual shooting at the university's upper gate, and that was kind of a thing. So making friends as a Syrian uh, in Lebanon at the time was quite a difficult, very difficult task for me as I was considered the adversary. And as much as I needed to step outside myself and to draw on my own imagination to see Lebanon through the lens of its citizens, I was also thirsty for them to see me with an empathetic lens, expressly because they assume me to be their enemy or their adversary at that time. So I had to reflect and correct my course. And I had to be aware of my own biases and assumptions. Uh, within four years, the majority of my friends were Lebanese. Finally, uh, 2001 uh, was winter time. I arrived uh, in Syria and that became my fourth home, my career soared, but then that too was hijacked. I worked at, uh, um, it was the first, first private media outlet in Syria. It was a radio station launched in 2005. And from 2005 until December 31st, 2011, I had the privilege to say, good morning, Syria, sabah al-khair, Surya in Arabic. And this was every day to millions of radio listeners across Syria. It was such a privilege. Uh, it was a three hour daily live show uh, it was award-winning uh, and everything that you heard Annika say for uh, seven consecutive uh, years. The Rand Corporation uh, had dubbed me at the time Oprah of Syria. They were doing research on the creative use of media um, in the Middle East and kind of caught on to what I was doing. Uh, and I often traveled to the United States to speak about my firsthand experience of media's power in sociocultural transformation. So, in that decade of a, a radio media career in Syria, 
I had to take risks and I had to learn how to manage uncertainty. I had the opportunity to work inside the system to create change bottom up and I took it. I understood what it meant to be self-censored, how to tread the red lines imposed by the authorities. I can tell you there's no toolbox or university that can teach you how to navigate censorship. It's a skill you master by taking risks. And you kind of start knowing when to push the envelope, how much, for how long, and, and when do you know how and when to step back, for how much, and for how long. Uh, it's there that I learned uh, that I had to rely on um, not only on kind of the, the reality of the situation and, and the facts, but more so in my gut feeling, my sense of, is this a risk or is it not? And um, addressing the complexity of all this, I, I needed to also be very resourceful and I needed to be prepared. I needed to be patient and I needed to be persistent and use those innovative means to become an outlet for grassroots and cultural expression. But all of that, that was then. January 18, 2012, um, the United States became my fifth home. After being forced to leave Syria, my family, my friends, my career. And so once again, I had to embrace uncertainty and I had to be comfortable with the utmost uncomfortable situation there is. This time I was displaced as an adult, compelled to reinvent myself and reframe my obstacles uh, into opportunities as my 1990 experience had taught me. So why is this all important? Um, all, all of what I built in a decade, the hard work, the 7 million listeners, the positive impact, most importantly, the human relationships involved were gone in a blink of an eye. So no one can prepare you for that. Since I arrived in the United States, I uh, faced a myriad of challenges and opportunities. The opportunities, of course, presented me with an appreciation of the country and just remarkable friends that opened their hearts and their homes for me. However, the, the asylum process, uh, that was a significant trial for me. I, uh, it was 2012, uh, one of the immigration offices, you go through a lot of those and a lot of paperwork. I've, I've never had so much insight into my life <laughs> at that time. Um, and one of the officers was you know, looking at all my background and he said, with good intentions, you seem like you were somebody back home. Well, I'm sorry to tell you, you're nobody here now. It's not gonna be easy. And he was right. It wasn't easy, but he was wrong to say that I'm nobody. Um, but I can tell you, I'm so glad that he said that to me because it pushed me from feeling sorry for myself to feeling gratitude. It was an instant mind shift from playing not to lose to playing to win. So I just had to walk out of that office. Um, I decided I don't want help. Uh, and I decided I just, I really just want to be someone in a new country again to give back to my new home. And if I can't find work, I must be able to create it. And so as um, Colin Powell used to say, get mad and get over it, <laughs> which is what I did because acceptance is key to moving forward to what could be. So uh, since, that, since 2012, uh, I helped found Suri Ali, which means Syria is mine and it means surreal. It's a Syrian independent online radio that fosters peace building, reconciliation and, and democracy. And then I moved on from Suri Ali and I found my own company, Honey And. The And is significant because I love to collaborate with people. So, um, and, and thus the And. Um, it's a creative consulting and coaching business. In 2014, I was granted a scholarship and earned an executive master's degree in international affairs from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. Mind you, uh, I grew up scorning politics for all the obvious reasons you just heard me say. And so I was also very curious and wanted to understand what I disdain. 
At the time, I decided to do my thesis on the role of media and arts amid conflict and peace. My passion for harnessing the power of media and the arts for peace was uh, strengthened due to the research, my turbulent life, my experiences, uh, especially in you know growing up in all the creativity that I was growing up in. This led to a creation of an online course on the role of media and arts for peace, short for that, MAP, with the US Institute of Peace and one of the most agile organizations I've come to know, the Geneva Center for Security Policy, which launched in May 2017. 2018, alongside a business partner, I decided, okay, let's launch MAP as a global education and talent agency to help reconcile the lives of displaced media and art professionals like myself by rebuilding their careers and economic livelihoods, by promoting their culture as a means of change, shifting the narrative about who they are, not nobody, not refugees, but people, professionals seeking normalcy. I taught MAP in several leading academic institutions, Georgetown University, University of Denver, and many others. And by the way, after eight years in being in the United States, I did become a US citizen. I voted and my first win uh, was revealed yesterday. So <laughs> there is that, there is hope. Um, the point is the, the constant loss in my life uh, and in the lives of a lot of people that experience conflict, that has become my drive to continue picking up pieces and rebuilding. I've, I've had to learn how to leverage my fear. Uh, I, I had to teach myself humility to the best that I can because the latter is so much internal work because really pride can take over due to loss. Finally uh, come COVID-19 and that impacted everyone's livelihood, including mine and has forced me to once again, rethink my business and uh, my future. So you see, change and what we have been calling the new normal, these are constant. The, the pain and uncertainty due to circumstances and crises are inevitable. How we respond to them, that is a choice. Thank you. Can't hear you, Annika. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I was uh, just saying, uh, honey, thank you so much for, for sharing your personal story. And, and it's uh, extremely uh, inspiring, I um, must say. Very difficult, but also extremely inspiring. And I think as we, as we had our pre-chat leading up to this meeting, I realized that almost the adaptive leadership principles should really were, I was thinking if they were designed around your experience, because as you picked up also a number, the, the, the critical importance of empathy, uh, of course, both for others, but also um, uh, uh, for you to be understood uh, by others. And creativity, uh, innovation and experimentation was obviously a, a core component throughout your whole life and, 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 learn, and journey. Uh, the issue, of course, is closely linked to the taking risks, as you mentioned, you know, where is the balance? And this is something that became a, a key, key conversation we had on at the seminar on Thursday, the, the need for innovation, the need for creativity, but then, of course, how do you balance the risks uh, and how that, does that factor in? So then, of course, I can go on and on. It was really wonderful and very powerful. And this is really a, a wonderful model to see how you can come out of huge difficulties uh, and kind of recreate uh, and, and uh, re, um, retake the initiative of your life. And then, of course, in that process, you become a, a wonderful net contributor at the visa security with everybody else who are engaging with you. So this is just really wonderful. And I really liked the point that you raised quite early on, on never forget the person that give, which is so true for everybody, everywhere, every day. So thank you so much. And then I will hand over, I will, uh, I'm absolutely delighted to be introducing Lili Tapa, who uh, has joined us from Nepal. As you will see, uh, we are panelists, 
uh, all the way from Alaska, where Bonnie is, uh, and then across uh, to uh, Lily, who's based in Nepal. And she is the founder of Women for Human Rights, which is an organization that brings together uh, Nepalese women, many of whom her were the young wives of men which were killed in Nepal's 11 years uh, insurgency. So it's out of their women's uh, experiences and isolation and, and, and difficulty uh, that um, uh, emerge when their husbands were killed, that you uh, got your force uh, to engage and provide a network and a process and a, a support effort, uh, helping many, 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 many women uh, in that issue. And I think this is, I like very much the fact that, that you have as a choice to call not widows, but single women which of course is also a way to empower uh, them uh, rather than the heavily uh, symbolic widow term. So helping them to, uh, to give them a chance to grieve together and to learn how to speak out and deal with the social and economic barriers that they face. And then of course it's thanks through uh, uh, TAPS International that we have had the absolute uh, privilege and pleasure to meet you and to get to know your work. So it's with great uh, humbleness and honor, I hand over the word uh, to Lily. Thank you, uh, Anika. Namaste uh, from Nepal. Um, actually, first of all, I really wanted to congratulate all of us for having a first female vice president in the United States. Mm -hmm. Actually, I was listening her speech. It was such a motivational and inspirational. And it was motivational not only for the women of the United States, but all the women all around the world. It was fantastic. And I'm going to share you about uh, the little bit experiences, how the conflict affected women, not only the widows, all these conflicts affected women are trying their level best to bring the peace in our communities. So basically you all know that Nepal has made very less progress in issues of the justice, truth and reparation for victims of 10 years of conflict. Though the government of Nepal has a fundamental obligation to investigate and prosecute um, uh, serious violations of international human rights law that were committed during the conflict. And you all know that there were two commissions, uh, truth and reparation commissions and the enforced uh, disappearance uh, commissions has been set up to address the issues of the victims. But unfortunately, both the commissions are failed both the commissions were not victims friendly uh, and failed to address the 63,000 cases that has been reported to the uh, TRC, Truth and Reconciliation Commissions, and thousands of people who have been disappeared, um, that cases has been reported to the Disappearance Committee. Not a single cases has been addressed till date. It's so painful. I have invited here one of my uh, colleague, Shanti here, uh, who is herself is a conflict widow, whose husband has been killed. Uh, uh, she is a military widow and whose husband has been killed when she has a just two years old baby when he was doing uh, his duty and he has been killed by the Maoist at the time of the conflict. Then uh, Shanti is now leading a, a huge network of conflict affected women called uh, Nispaksha. And she herself organized a lot of uh, conflict affected women in her network and doing, you know, trying to build the uh, peace and harmony within the group. So I just invited Shanti here. Uh, so you know that um, uh, because the commission has not been uh, able to, um, you know, address the issues of the conflict victims, and it's just because the government have repeatedly, you know, because this is the second uh, second commissions, second commission, the first commissions they work for four years with no uh, any result, and the second commissions also been just uh, formulated by the government. Uh, without the um, consultation with the victims of the conflict, you know, they never have, a, you know, have a consultation. That's why this commission is not victims friendly. Uh, so uh, we actually then we thought that and even the, this, not only the commission, because all these the organizations, institutions, they are not been addressing the uh, proper issues of the conflict affected women, you know. So that is why what we thought that we actually, I personally as being a conflict widow, my husband has been killed in Gulf War in, uh, in Iraq. So uh, I know the, you know, uh, the pain, uh, the sorrow, how we have to 
gone through uh, hearing the immediate loss of, of, of our husband in, in, who has been so much of involved in bringing peace in other countries. So that is why we formed a big national network of the conflict affected women. We call this Nispakya in Nepali. Uh, and then uh, this network has been organized more than 8,000 conflict affected uh, women, regardless of their husband's political background. We don't care about what their husband's background, if uh, they are from the Maoist or they are from the security forces. We just bring them together in the network. And basically what we've been doing to that network, actually we've been you know, uh, trying to advocate a lot of the common issues of the conflict affected women. Uh, and then also uh, we uh, basically currently at present what we have been doing because the commissions are not gender friendly, all these 63,000 cases is been uh, dumped into, into the, on the table of the commissioners. It's not been addressed properly. Not a single victim has got a justice till debt. So we are actually together, our network together with the other victims network, we already been filed the cases to the Supreme Court against the government to amend the laws, you know, which is not gender friendly. I, I, I don't know, uh, maybe you must be surprised to know that Still, uh, in our country, uh, you know, the sexual violence, you know, sexual violence and rape survivors issues is not been incorporated into the definition of conflict. So they are totally neglected. Not a single rape survivors, not a sexual, a single sexual violence uh, women have got a justice, have got any kind of a facilities uh, from the government, not from the other organizations, except the NGOs doing few more things for them. And you know, the impact of the conflict uh, in our country has been disproportionate. And women in Nepal have suffered torture, abuse, and thousands of, as I told you, thousands of the women have faced uh, sexual violence um, uh, during the conflict period from both the conflicting uh, party, from the security forces and from the Maoist as well. But we don't have, uh, still we don't have a single you know, accurate uh, data of how many women have been raped, how many women have been sexually violenced, how many women have lost their husbands, their family, the property. We don't have accurate data. The data is so different. Uh, the government data is totally different than the data that we collected from the civil society. So we, we've been lobbying from our network to have a authentic um, quantitative and the qualitative data um, of the conflict victims, but we've still not been able to get that. Even though the, you know, the gender role has been changed uh, due to the conflict uh, with more women becoming head of the households, uh, like us, like me, uh, on the, like Shanti, on the, uh, basically, and taking on the financial, physical, and psychological burden of taking care of the, uh, after all their families, uh, despite of um, no educations, no skills, no resources, you know, like uh, Shanti, you can take the example of Shanti herself, you know, she's not that much educated, but she was too young when her husband all of a sudden killed when he was doing a duty and she has to take care of her two year old uh, daughter. But very gladly, gladly, I just want to share with her now Shanti's daughter is grown up now. She's, she's starting doing her engineering. You know, it's, so how women take care all the responsibilities on her own. Shanti is a good example for that. And you know that conflict in Nepal uh, left behind thousands of the young widows. Almost the government data says that 9,000 uh, women have been turned into widowed uh, by the conflict. But we are not uh, that much, uh, you know, uh, convincing with the data of the government because there are more than, you know, 30, 30,000 people have been died. Uh, and, and we are assuming that all these uh, 30,000, uh, 20,000 people uh, are unmarried. We cannot say that. Government come up with the 9,000 uh, widowed widows from the conflict, but we are uh, still questioning about how, how what are the status of those 20,000 male who's been died in the conflict. They are must not be unmarried men, so we are not. We we assume that there must be more than 15 to 20,000 widowed uh, due due to the conflict. And you know that over 60 percent of the conflict affected women have faced sexual violence. And that, that has created a 
hundreds of children uh, born out of rape. And we are dealing with that cases right now because these children is not been entitled with any kind of a recognition, you know, because, uh, you know, in, in our country, we've been fighting to have a citizenship in the name of the mother. And you can imagine how it is so difficult to get the citizenship of those children born out of rape. So we are we are already been advocating a lot and filing a cases, many cases in the Supreme Court against the government to amend the law, laws to bring the those kind of a favorable uh, favorable policies uh, to address those kind of hidden issues. You know that's why we have uh, organized uh, those uh, conflict affected women in our group to address the common issues of the victims and to build the sustainable peace in the community. Uh, regardless of their family's background. And that is why, you know, this our network actually, Nispaksha, we call it in Nepali. Nispaksha means uh, unfair, unfair. We don't, uh, uh, we are not biased with any uh, political background. We are just, uh, you know, um, focused on how, what and how will be the women get justice. The conflict victims, women get justice and their issues will be addressed by the government. That is how we've been dealing with. And you know, the, our network actually, Conflict of Victory Women's Network have been successful in bringing women from both the conflicting parties together in one umbrella. And that helped, you know, actually really helped in bringing peace in the community. That is how, you know, I'm very glad to share you that. That's why we have been awarded with the nation's greatest award for peace by then president almost five years back, you know, so because it was so difficult for us to bring the both the families together in one umbrella, you know, the, when we started that eight years uh, back, and it was uh, really a challenging job for us, you know, when we address the issues of the bring the, you know, the wives of the Maoists, then the security forces questioning us, when we deal with the security forces wives and then the Maoist uh, Always to wear question, and it was really a difficult task. But nowadays, it's all been solved, and they are together. They are together working in one umbrella, bringing peace in the community. Uh, besides that, you know, the network actually, the conflict affected women's network, have been mobilizing in the community for the reconciliation, for the reparation, um, with the various activities. Basically, Thank you very much. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. My time is gone. It is coming to closure. Thank you. So yeah. I've just come up with a little bit in the conclusion, like Nepal's transition situations providing, you know, the conflict affected many opportunities as well as because I just wanted to share the positive aspects of the conflict as well, because you know that the gender stereotypes has been changed as being a female household. And then again, you know, this conflict has really, the, you know, the transition and given a lot of opportunities for, for the women such as participation. You know, the, now a lot of conflict of to women are at the decision making level. They has been elected, you know, and I would, I'm happily share you that our members, almost 146, 146 widows now has been elected at the local level election. Now they are in the policy making, you know, that's the huge thing. This is wonderful. And I, if I can just, I think it's a wonderful. We, we soon have to, um, otherwise we will not have time for the last speaker. And the thing is also, I can, if I can just add that, this is just the beginning of a conversation. We really enjoy that this is kicking off a project that we are, are doing. We very much look forward to continue this. If you want to have a, a final, final uh, 15 seconds, please. Uh, otherwise we will not have time for the last. It's wonderful. There will be questions I will be happy to answer, but what we believe that until and unless all these victims, especially the women, do not get justice, the peace will not prevail. That is what we believe, and we've been trying our level best to bring that thing. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Lily. That was extremely interesting and, and very inspiring. And I think also what you started off uh, uh, saying that uh, or explaining really that not only uh, the, the, these uh, women lose, had the grief by losing their husbands or spouses, but then they were even put in a worse situation because of it. So it was not just 
receiving your support, but being even more troubled and having to face the very uh, and embrace the uncertainty and difficult situation. And I think that the the work that you very kindly shared in, and I apologize for the short short uh, time available, but the 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 work that you shared it, it was such exemplified in in terms of creativity, uh, finding solutions to the problem that you saw, and and really being able to inspire many to engage and uh, you innovate that innovates with determination both you and and your colleagues and through skills again um, uh, i think the the whole the whole process, the, your whole project, your whole work is defined by, driven by empathy. And I love the fact that it's also very inclusive. It doesn't matter from where, a background and so on. If it's a, if it's a, a single woman or, or someone um, otherwise called widow, that regardless of background, they are welcome and they are to become or have an ability to engage as positive leaders for peace. I think that's absolutely wonderful. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for that. Um, and now, uh, finally, we have uh, we have Professor uh, Mike Hardy, who, of course, all you know, he's the chair of the International Leadership Association, which is hosting us all for this session. And I will, of course, he's also the director of the Center for Trust, Peace and Social Relations at Coventry University. Uh, for us, we're very lucky because on the one hand, he is the chair of the ILA, but it also happens to work exactly on the topic that we are focusing on. So it's a, we are a absolutely privileged and of course uh, uh, Professor Hardy brings in the experience on, on as a diplomat but also working in the Arab world and in Asia he's worked for the British Council and, and of course primarily on, on issues related to intercultural dialogue and is engaged in I would say any every relevant process to our conversation that there exists on the planet so he's either started them or I'm sure he's a member of them so that's very uh, useful for us and it's been also awarded a number of um, uh, 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 medals and prizes and awards for the outstanding work that he has uh, pursued uh, for a long time and of course I see that the highlight uh, is on innovation and vulnerability, protective security and all behavioral aspects which are all at the core of what we are to discuss now. I will be a little bit short because I know you already know <laughs> the professor so I'll hand over to Mike. Uh, the floor is yours. So, Anika, thank you very much. And this is a desperately hard act to follow. The three uh, hugely emotional and real stories. But um, what it tells us is a few, I think, basic things that I wanted to focus on just in a very few short minutes. Partly it explains why I'm involved in leadership and why I've arrived here from an early career as I was a trained economist, then I went into the foreign service. None of that gave me the satisfaction I now get in trying to fill the gaps that you have described so powerfully for us this morning. So what have we said? We've said that positive peace is important to people, it matters, and it's destroyed by trauma by conflict, by war, by events. And what happens to people through those experiences is they find it really difficult to pick up. They lose faith in the simple uh, reality that the future might be better than the present. They lose faith in that. Um, and it, it tells us that we have to work at positive peace. And there's no better place to start that work than here in leadership. The, the International Leadership Association, this is exactly the right home for this debate. So thank you, Anika, for bringing it, and thank you to my co-collaborators for their wonderful stories. When you have empathy, you share loss. And it's only when you share or feel loss, we've heard a lot about that already, that you can begin to identify what you can do in a practical sense. In 2004, after Christmas, my Christmas, I was living in Indonesia and in northern Sumatra, communities were destroyed by a tsunami. It's not just humankind that brings the grief and trauma that we've been discussing. 250,000 people were swept away in 20 minutes. That's bad enough, but what it leaves behind is this huge vacuum, this huge trauma of which we've heard. My ambassador sent me up to Aceh 
to mobilize and help the uh, relief work that was going to take place. That, had, that the international community is amazing when these things happen. It mobilizes immediately. What I found changed my life. And it's why I came back, it's why I formed my research center at Coventry, and it's why I now am engaged in leadership. When I arrived in Acha in the town, four days after this had happened, I met a man sitting on the side of the road and I stopped the car and got out and I sat down next to him because I was so, so traumatized by what I was seeing. And I was a visitor, I was an observer. I've learned never to apologize about being an observer of other people's traumas. Take responsibility for using those observations productively and constructively. I sat next to this guy and he said to me, Pack Mike, because I was known, familiar, it's wonderful, seniority is recognized. Pack Mike, I've lost 87 members of my family. This is four days after the tsunami. All I could feel was that coming from my Western comfortable elite existence, I don't even know 87 members of my family or where they all are. I probably got them. I probably have to think about it. I, I have, of course, my close family. He knew them all. He knew which ones he'd lost. He knew the 12 year old boy that had survived and he'd sent off to Medan to say with a distant cousin. Now I only raised that because to have made any positive contribution to his circumstances and his future, you had to empathize with where he was sitting. And what I found in Ache informed the work I think that we need to do in taking Ron Heifetz's brilliant ideas about adaptive leadership and mobilizing what I call the leadership phenomenon. These aren't types of leaders or approaches to leaders, it's a phenomenon uh, that leadership can actually fill the vacuum that all of us can describe so powerfully. So what did I find in that first mission in Ache? Apart from struggling to sleep and relate to the utter destruction that mother nature brings upon us, uh, from time to time, I found people completely disillusioned with their circumstances, bewildered by why it should happen to them. These are devout people who've been let down in some way and couldn't resolve. Contagious anxiety about what was going to happen next. Anger and despair and a whole degree of apathy, which says, well, it's just all too much. Now that describes not just the aftermath of a tsunami, it also describes what you have been describing, the aftermath of conflict, of loss, of tragedy, of car crashes, of wars, and of civil insurgents. What it, I think, tells us is that we have to find a way of creating a phenomenon of leadership that can help that can sit down alongside people and build with them a future that's better than the current time that they're in. And you've described this, Bonnie, so well. Honey, you've described how you've mobilized the, the forces within you to have this impact. And the work in Lily in Nepal is just amazing among these people who otherwise would be traumatized victims, but are now champions and heroines. And that's so important. But there are a few things we can do practically. We must not rest on our laurels and say we empathize and understand. We must construct and build something to fill the void, something to, to provide um, movement rather than being distracted by a moment. So we've talked in adaptive leadership about building leadership development programs. These can be in schools, they can be in women's group, they can be in primary education or in universities. We have to help people to be really much more comfortable with the insanity that they're experiencing, with the trauma and the loss. How do we do that? We have to encourage people, as Anika has been reminding us, to be innovative, to take risks. We can't do that if we only applaud success. So we have to find ways of being really comfortable with rewarding failure, with saying, look, you've got to have it because it's the intent that matters, the intention. 
How do we seek strength from unexpected places? This man on the side of the road with his family lost had strength. He had inner strength. He had a belief that when he got over this, he could stand up and help someone else. And that's exactly what we watched him do. He had inner strengths that otherwise we'd have just considered him to be a, a poor, unfortunate survivor. Let's look after him. Let's cuddle him. Let's put our arms around him. But no, he was a strong, a source of strength in that community. And had we not recognized that, it would have been our failure, not his. How do we nurture the empathy I've described? How do we get people to be endemically, naturally empathetic? So they wake up in the morning and think well of people and think passionately and emotionally about other people's circumstance. And finally, how do we get self-correction into our vocabulary? How do we get the ability for ourselves to make mistakes and to be imperfect and not to get traumatized by that, but to get inspired in the way, honey, you did when you described how you reacted to the immigration officer? You didn't change the way you went about your approach to him. You changed the way you went about your future life. And that's, that's, we have to try and do that. You can't teach people how to do that, but we have to create a leadership phenomenon that shows example, that shows abilities, that shows competences and skills. And we have to make mistakes when we do it. Finally, how can we create inspiration without falling into the trap of celebrity, which I worry about. How do we do it from behind closed doors? Invisible leadership that my good friend Gil Hilton talks about with her, uh, our recently uh, deceased colleague, Georgia Sorensen. Invisible leadership may be part of the phenomenon that I'm referring to. We have to find a way of inspiring without saying it's me, 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 and how big and how good I am, without ce the celebrity impact that seems so important in 2021 and 2022 as we look forward. So I'm intensely practical. I love the messages and the stories and the personal experiences that enliven the discussion, but let's find out how to create a leadership phenomenon that will take us forward. Thank you, Anika. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mike, for those very uh, thoughtful and uh, inspiring reflections. I love the concluding sentence about uh, seeking to create a phenomena. Uh, I think this is really taking us to the next level. But before saying that, I also appreciate very much that you uh, show through your own uh, stories in terms of how empathy fills such a, a central role in you, even changing your direction in life. And, and then fortunately placing you where you are now uh, that you could continue and uh, commit yourself to looking at how to strengthen uh, and contribute to um, peace and, uh, 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 and reconciliation in the, in, uh, in the way in which you do. I also really appreciate that, that uh, uh, particularly the point about that we need to reward uh, failures uh, rather than not only the, the best practices and the success stories, but also to look at uh, intent, that it is the intent that matters. I think also adding to that, even those that we think are successful and have achieved a lot, uh, know that they wouldn't be that without having committed a lot of mistakes on the way. So the good news is, I think we're all probably masters as at failures, uh, and then the whole challenge is just that we have the, the, the resources, the mental and the physical resources and the stamina to then work with our failures, to think about, to do the self-reflection and to do the self-correction in order to uh, be uh, better team players in the bigger community that wants to do good uh, things. So uh, thank you so much. You're wonderfully pulling all these different things together and I think very complimentary in, in every way. Uh, as you will see, we have uh, we're running a little bit uh, after schedule, but we have kindly been given a few extra minutes by Bridget, who is our collective boss in this uh, endeavor. Uh, so um, if there is uh, 
Uh, if anyone wants to raise a question or a comment or a reflection, uh, this I know that uh, I have my, I wanted also to introduce to you, uh, Peter Cunningham, uh, a colleague of mine who is uh, participating here and who is the director of leadership at the GCSP. And he's of course also the driving force between next year's, behind the next year's International Leadership Association meeting in Geneva. Peter, do you want to say a few words? Annika, thank you. Well, I certainly don't want to detract from any questions. Uh, so, so uh, just very briefly to say that it's uh, it's rather humbling to 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 sit here and listen. Um, in in the teaching of leadership, there's lots of talking, and 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 uh, I think that um, what I've heard today is is uh, given a food for thought and for pause and and and, and reflection and. Just to say that next year, we're still in the middle of this year, but next year we will be in Geneva, uh, hopefully, or if not in Geneva, carrying the Geneva spirit into some form of online blended virtual place together. Um, and, and this idea of, of uh, that everybody, uh, I heard, you certainly heard in everybody's uh, uh, story, uh, the importance of t togetherness and, 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 and doing things together. None of these stories was a solo uh, journey. Um, and collaboration and working together can be so easy to talk about. Um, you sense so natural actually for everybody on this call to do probably in practice without even thinking about it. Would it be even thinkable to not do things together? But but it seems to be when you get to a more political level and when you get to a more complex level that, that collaboration is becoming a little bit more challenging. Um, and so how do we push beyond those boundaries is what we'd like to, to explore next year, uh, um, but that's next year. Um, so I just want to say thank you so much for allowing us an opportunity to hear. And, and I think there are questions, Annika, so I, I, I hand back to you. Hey, hey, thank you so much, Peter. I really appreciate that. And now you know who's behind next year's uh, uh, event. Um, uh, yes, I see a question from Miriam, uh, which I thought was very useful and very interested to hear the panelists' responses to, which is about what would uh, the panel say? What was the most important now uh, uh, most uh, important that you have learned about yourself as leaders uh, going through your experience is there one thing that you feel has really come out through your experiences that you learned about yourself who would like to start we have the panelists well just uh, briefly annika uh, it was uh, such a epiphany for me to really get to know people at, at the human level, to see people so differently and to embrace their needs and their culture and see, um, I, I loved Mike, what you said about invisible leadership. That's beautiful. And that's what we all strive to be, to connect at the most authentic level to bring out the pain and the grief and meet people in the dark places and walk with them in their pain. And by doing that, build trust so that we can connect and then build on those relationships and those friendships that will last a lifetime. And I know, honey and Lily, you've done that throughout your life. And you have a following around the world who dearly love you. And I know who you authentically love in return. And I think that's how we will we will change the world. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Bonnie. Uh, do we have other panelists who wants to come in on that question? Yes, honey. We don't hear you. We see you. Yeah, suddenly I lost my mic um, as a radio host, believe it or not. So, <laughs> um, yeah, it's just to answer to that question, I, you know, there's so many leadership styles and principles. At the end of the day, it is about being human. And then when you're human, it's what, you know, Mike was saying, you, you know, you need to celebrate your failures the same way you would celebrate your wins. Um, and, and I can tell you, I've had a lot of, I mean, I just summarized something. I, for decades of my life in 10 minutes, uh, I, I revealed the wins and some of the pain, but there is a lot of failure behind that. There's a lot of grief. There is a, a lot of times where I, uh, 
you know, until today, I have to deal with these things and, and with the anxiety and, and to how I respond, but it's a constant learning of, okay, I, I need to respond to this right now. I, I can't react to this. And every time you, you experience crises in your life, it's a, it's a choice that that is going to be a learning experience that's going to make you grow. Or is that going to make you spiral into a negative, bitter, et cetera, et cetera, uh, person? Mm -hmm. um, but it is looking at, you know, I failed. Like, I did this wrong. I, I need to do this differently next time. I still have failures. Um, they're, and they're not going anywhere. Um, so celebrating failure is the same way we celebrate our wins is important. I just understanding that we are simply just human. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, honey. Uh, I see Mike has his um, mic actually off, on. So it's a great question, Miriam. And of course, we're always responsible. But I just want to add, if there's one thing I have learned in my travels, and it was from the guy sitting by the side of the road. And it's the importance of stories and storytelling. So none of the leadership that I've conducted, however imperfectly since, has left out storytelling. And storytelling is about a constructing and describing as we have today, but it's also about listening and hearing, not just listening, actually hearing. So I think that a leadership phenomenon without storytelling, without narrative, and not just in those cultures where it's important, as it is in Sumatra, mm. is really a fundamental lesson. Don't ever forget to encourage people to tell stories and to hear yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mike. Uh, very, very uh, powerful. I think we're... Um, I wanted to invite uh, Lily as well. Mm, no, I also the, wanted to add what Mike just have shared here. Like, you know, uh, if you don't, don't give a platform to share their stories, if you don't, them, uh, don't organize them in the group, then their voices will never heard. So what I learned from my ex work experiences from many years, like you have to be organized in a group to you know, change the, your sorrows into their strengths. That's why we've been mostly focusing on making the groups. That is what we, I learned from the past. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, and I think this is, uh, I think it's, it's also, it's, commenting on both uh, questions, other questions that come up in the chat, as well as uh, as this one about what you have personally learned. There's also a question. I like the one uh, uh, from King Yan Tian, failure is the mother of success. And I think that uh, we have all experienced it. And it is indeed a good uh, uh, um, concluding comment on some of the, the challenges of, of leadership. Uh, there is uh, several questions or that has been raised and I'm raising this is the last one because I do know that we are coming to closure now but it was the if the panelist uh, wants to comment as you're concluding about to what extent you can uh, uh, move forward either in community or heal yourself what is the balance between uh, reconciliation through communities uh, as well as through yourself or if there are any other final comment you want to make uh, as we're wrapping up this absolutely wonderful uh, panel. Honey? Um, yeah, that's a deep question. <laughs> um, and I would say uh, to answer that simply both, we, we, we need to look in and we also need to look out, but we need to make sure when we're looking out and when we're sharing those stories or leading with story that we are able to create safe spaces and safe environments to be able to, to do so, because it's not always comfortable. It's not always comfortable to tell your story over and over again. I can tell you I've said it a thousand times and it's still very uncomfortable for me. Um, uh, it can be re-traumatizing for some people um, to, to be telling their stories. So just to keep an, an eye for that. Um, so working internally and working with community are both very, very important because um, just, you know, looking back at um, my life and, and the stories that you're hearing right now, it, it you know, it, it takes a village. <laughs> it takes all of us. 
I, you can't do anything on your own. You just, it, it's not possible. Um, and so having a, a, a collaborative spirit is very important. Um, to please stop working in silos. I mean, we all need to work together. This is yeah. it's really important. Mm -hmm. And I would just leave with saying, you know, um, accept what is and, and create, create what you want um, without expectations, but rather with gratitude. Wonderful. I think that's a great closure. Thank you, honey. If uh, Bonnie, Mike or Lily want to say you have 10 seconds each just to say thank you and, and or not to say thank you but to say your concluding thoughts before we close the panel we run a little bit over time but we really appreciate the, the value of the conversation so bonnie no annika i just to echo what all of my panelists have said honey that was so beautiful the way you just put that and we must move forward in a place of gratitude love and compassion so thank you for today it was amazing thank you very much bonnie and lily for listening thank you so much okay wonderful wonderful i think mike might have um, since he's chairing the whole ila i think he might have left mike are you still here no, i think we're, we're running a little bit over time so um, with that in mind i would like to uh, on uh, behalf of the co-organizers thanks uh, everybody for engaging and contributing and listening and of course as i mentioned uh, it's all about humans and we are only getting started so we very much hope to hear more from you and engage with you and and to bring these very important stories forward indeed uh, as uh, mike was saying it's all about the narrative about the storytelling which also of course then informs and empowers people to move forward collectively and individually so thank you everybody for this and and uh, we look forward to hopefully see you again at some other point in time. Thank you very much.